Today we have uh, four presenters all together. Two of those will be done virtually. And first up, we have Forrest N.B. Appearing with us today is Mike Legier, board member, and Andy Berrio, secretary, treasurer. So, Mr. Berrio, Mr. Legier, you'll have 20 minutes for your presentation. When you have five minutes remaining, I'll hold my hand up. In the event you don't see me, I'll have to wait till you take a breath and I'll use the mic. Don't take any uh, disrespect to it. I just want you to know where you are. At the end of the 20 minutes, you'll have 40 minutes of questioning, 10 minutes from each political party. Sometimes they might so choose to not complete the 10 minutes, but normally you'll have 40 full minutes of questioning. Um, so listen, we're happy to have you here. We're encouraged by it. You have 20 minutes. The floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, committee members. Um, pleasure to be here today. I think this is important work that the committee is doing, and we hope we can we can contribute to. Uh, Excuse me, um, uh, Mr. Barry. I'm sorry to. Um, I forgot two things. It's, it's early. I'm sorry. <laughs> is there any substitutions? Any at all? Other side? Yes. David Kuhn for Megan Mitten. Kuhn for Mitten. And last but not least, as for the minister. Feel free to take your jackets off. Go ahead, Mr. Berrio. Sorry about that. No, I, I'm Mr. Legere. This is Mr. Berrio. <laughs> yeah, no. Very good. Okay. Morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Again, thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chair, to uh, present uh, here today to the committee. Uh, I'm going to give a very brief introduction as to uh, who the, uh, what the organization is, Forest New Brunswick. Um, and then I'll jump into the, I guess, the, the, the meat of the presentation here. So Forest NB is the New Brunswick Forest Products Association, and uh, we've been in existence since 1957. Uh, we represent the forest product manufacturers, the majority of the forest product manufacturers in the province. Uh, what's important really, I think, for us today is the fact that we not only represent manufacturers of forest products, uh, lumber companies, pulp mills, panel producers, but also some very small manufacturers, family mills that deal in, uh, in wholesale and retail at the local level. Uh, all the way down to uh, lobster trap manufacturers and everything in between. So it's, it's a, it really is a, a broad spectrum of the industry that we represent. But uh, what's important, I think, to the committee here is that we're also land managers, and we manage about 70% of the forested land in the province. So that includes Crown uh, through the licensing agreements with the province, uh, industrial freehold that uh, companies own uh, themselves, and we also manage land for small private woodlot owners uh, under certain, certain situations as well. So really today what I'd like to accomplish is, is three things. And one is to share what our understanding is of, of science, uh, of uh, science of forest renewal and, and vegetation management. Uh, I hope that's not the only subjects we'll touch upon today. Uh, I know that's been the focus of many of the presentations, but I think we can, we can uh, help inform you on, on a, a broader scope of, of subject matter when it comes to, to forest management. Um, we want to convey to you why it's so important to, the, to, our, to our sector and to the province as well. And finally, we're going to try to answer your questions uh, to the best of our abilities and as our expertise allows us to, to make sure that you've got everything you need to make informed decisions here as, as a committee and, and moving forward with recommendations. So as I mentioned, uh, or Mr. Chairman, you mentioned, I am Mike Legere. I'm a board director with Forest NB. Andy Burial, my colleague here, is also uh, a board member. He's vice president of Woodlands during the day with Shillar Forest Products, and, and I am the, the director of government relations for, for AV Group. But we are here representing the industry as, as Forest NB representatives. Uh, the interesting thing is that we actually represent different parts of, of, the, of the sector. Uh, AV Group's a significant hardwood user, therefore we have quite a significant interest in hardwood management. And Schiller Forest Products are a, primarily a softwood user uh, in softwood lumber. So we, we do bring two different perspectives and, and I hope to take advantage of that. So quickly, this is a, a very quick rundown on, on the importance of the sector and, and, and why we feel it's important to, to convey how and why we manage forest lands the way we do. Uh, I think it goes without saying that forestry is a very important aspect of the, the economic and daily lives of New Brunswickers. Uh, certainly we employ just about 24,000 people directly and indirectly. Uh, think of the people that work in the sawmills, the pulp mills, it could be the, the, the person down at the local welding shop repairing a, a harvester head. It could be a, a salesman at a, at a truck dealership. Uh, we impact a lot, a lot of lives, for sure. And 
that translates, all this economic activity that we generate translates into $1.7 billion into, uh, into value added to the province. And, and, and that's money that gets distributed in the form of wages and taxes and, and profit to be reinvested into, into our, our mills and our facilities. Now, it also goes without saying that um, our woodland operations have an impact on the natural environment. We understand that. You can't derive the benefits I just described uh, without impacting something or someone. And anyone who would suggest otherwise really is, is either naive or, or they're trying to intentionally mislead you. We understand that everything we do has, has an impact, but it's our responsibility as forest land managers to minimize that impact and try to restore and maintain ecosystems to their original functions. That's really the essence of ecosystem management, derives some economic and social benefit while mitigating long-term environmental impact. Now, one of the tools we do to accomplish this is uh, to promote the success of what we call crop trees. And those are the trees that are, for us, they're commercially preferred. So it doesn't mean that we seek to eradicate other non-commercial species. It's, uh, it is our intention, though, to give uh, an advantage, or every advantage we can, to those crop trees. And we don't need to do uh, this across the entire forested landscape. Currently, only 13% of our entire forest is managed for this particular outcome. And these are not tolerant hardwood stands that are being converted. Uh, but these are stands that were originally and naturally conifer or, or intolerant mixed stands. So we're not permitted by law to convert tol uh, tolerant hardwood stands to conifer plantations. And, and believe me, as an employer of a, of a mill that uses hardwood, that would just be bad business for us. So one of the myths I'd like to debunk is uh, that of a province overrun with conifer plantations. It's simply a false, a false narrative. And, and DNR has the data to substantiate that, that with their, uh, their timber inventories. Uh, our forest composition has really been quite stable over the last 100 years. And it's roughly broken down to about 50% conifer dominated, 30% hardwood, and 20% mixed stands. Um, but I'll put all this debate into some scope and perspective, and, and then we can delve into the details of the, of the, uh, of the, during the question period. Okay, so let's apply a little bit of context to what's going on here. Presenters have thrown some very large numbers around in terms of utilization of, uh, of herbicide, glyphosate-based herbicide in particular in the province. Talked a lot about the size of clear cuts. Uh, talked a lot about uh, forest management, the way it's conducted now, the impact it has. And certainly I don't disagree that it does have an impact, but I want to put this into context and perspective for the committee members. Here on this slide, this is the province of New Brunswick. Not particularly large, 7.3 million hectares in, uh, in surface area. That's the entire province. Now, this inner circle, the green one, represents the forested area in the province. So that's 6.1 million hectares. We're a heavily forested province, about 84%. Again, 50% of that green area is dominated by conifers, 30% hardwood, and, and 20 intolerant mixed, as I mentioned previously. But stands, they, like tree stands vary very greatly in, in species composition and, and, and spatially, or, or where they occur within that green circle. And that's something that wasn't made entirely clear by Dr. Betts uh, a couple days ago when he was referencing the tolerant red spruce stands. I thought he gave an excellent presentation, but I thought he could have delved a bit deeper into uh, the, the fact that those types of stands are not ubiquitous across the province. Uh, but they're very much eco-region dependent. And I'll defer to my colleague, uh, Mr. Barrio, the forester, to speak a bit more about that later on. So some stands will be spruce or fir dominant, uh, prefer higher elevations, the microclimate there, all factors that coincide with what you're going to find in a certain stand in a certain region of the province. And each has to be managed according to the stand type and the desired objectives that we have. So let's talk a little bit about harvesting. So these harvest blocks that are set out annually are predetermined in an operational plan, which a professional forester would develop and it has to align with an overall management plan. And that's very much informed by industry and submitted and developed by, by, the, by DNR. But before any of those blocks are actually harvested, uh, the foresters will take out the areas of special concern, so wetlands, watercourse buffers, 
they have to account accommodate maple sugaries, areas around camps. We try to avoid harvesting too close to those when it's possible. And there's lots of other considerations that, again, Mr. Barrio can expand on. Now, what remains after that is, is, is open for, for harvesting if it's operable. Now, when taken as a whole, we're harvesting about that area that's left. It represents about 1% of the forest on an annual basis. That's what we'll be harvested. In fact, it's a little more. It's about 1.3%. So on your graphic here on the, on the slide, you can see that little dot in the bottom uh, in comparison to the entire forested area of the province. Now, make no mistake, the following year that dot will move to another spot, and then the following year to another spot, and then the following year to another spot. Now, that's where the regeneration comes in. After that, 1.3% uh, is harvested, and make no mistake, this isn't all clear cuts. Yes, a significant portion is, about 80%. But 20% is an alternate cutting, or a, a different type of, of harvesting technique, because you want a different outcome. And typically, that will be for hardwood gen uh, regeneration. So shelter wood cuts, strip cuts, these types of, of harvesting practices would be used to regenerate that type of forest that is particular to that particular part of the province. But the area that, uh, that is, uh, is cut, 67% uh, of it, or two-thirds, it'll be allowed to regenerate naturally. We're not going to go in, do any type of intervention with herbicide uh, or prepare the site. It's cut, wood transported to facilities, left to regenerate. And that's followed up on. It has to regenerate. If not, then you have to make an intervention. That's the regulation. The other third, or 33%, that area we're going to do a little more intensive management in that area, and that's the plantations. That's where we will come in and we will, uh, we will regenerate that forest with planted seedlings uh, that are selected for that site. We plant the right trees in the right spots, and we will apply glyphosate uh, once, possibly twice, over a 40 to 50 year rotation. So we will not go back to that spot for another 40 or 50 years. And that's an important point to remember because it speaks a little bit to what some presenters have, have spoke of already about being able to limit that intensive footprint within the province to allow us to do other things outside of that, things that the province and, and New Brunswickers want us to do. So just to back up here, so that little dot to the right, the 33%, there is where it is in, in relation to the entire forested area of the province. It's 0.3% of the province. Uh, it, it, it does consume, that small number consumes a lot of time and a lot of conversation. Uh, and uh, that, that's great, uh, but we do have to keep it in perspective. It's a very small part of the land base that's receiving this herbicide application. Again, once, possibly twice, over a 40 year period. So I'm going to turn this over to my colleague Andy Barrio to speak a little bit more about the application process. I want, I want the committee members to have a good understanding how this is done. Uh, some presenters have given the impression uh, during the course of the week that we simply dump this herbicide willy-nilly uh, anywhere uh, that we, we feel it's necessary. That couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, the, the application rates, uh, the wind velocity, there are many parameters that are taken under consideration. Um, but I also want to get into a conversation about what happens when we, when we don't or do not use this tool. So I'll turn it over to Andy to speak a bit more about the details. Morning, everyone. Um, so um, I have a couple slides here, and then uh, after that, I uh, also want to talk about some, some other forestry issues that I think are pertinent to the conversation here this morning. So um, from a forestry standpoint, uh, from a forest industry standpoint, Herbicides are considered an efficient and effective vegetative, uh, vegetation management tool. Um, it delivers the desired results at the lowest cost and the smallest environmental footprint. Um, we'd like to talk about that, that lowest cost and smallest footprint uh, some more later in the presentation. Um, it allows forest managers to responsibly and sustainably balance our forest resource. An extensive research has been conducted by academics, industry, and government researchers on all aspects of herbicide use in our forest. And I believe you've heard uh, a number of studies this week uh, that, that represent some of those, uh, some of those, some of that research. So, now what I'd like to do this morning is um, give 
give the committee um, some perspective and some scope of what we actually do in New Brunswick, right? So, you know, what do we do when we say we herbicide areas? These, these, these plantations that are, that are needing herbicide application, they're, they're small areas over the land base. We use helicopters with automated booms that also have very specific, very, um, uh, you know, cutting edge technology in them which allows the specific area we're looking to apply the herbicide to be treated, right? So um, some of the other presentations this week um, talked about some of that technology, but I really want the, uh, the committee to understand that this is not just arbitrarily spraying areas, not understanding what's on the land base. We spend a significant amount of time making sure the product is applied where we want it. Uh, also, uh, in, in terms of weather, Mike mentioned weather, you know, the, I don't think we, we, we've heard enough in the conversation about the length that is taken to make sure that the weather is understood when this is being applied. We're talking about, uh, you know, less than 16 kilometer an hour uh, wind, so that, that's barely a gust. Uh, less than certain temperatures, 24 degrees Celsius or less. Uh, no rain within three hours of herbicide being applied or forecasted after the event. Um, I think that's important to understand. Just so, again for some scope and some perspective, three quarters of the spray program is, is completed in the morning and a quarter of that at night, mostly due to the weather parameters that permit. And the majority of the, the, the program is completed between you know, the middle of August and the middle of September. Uh, in New Brunswick, the Department of Environment and local government enforce operational controls for herbicide use. Um, in my previous slide, I had mentioned that the GIS technology is very precise, and you know I want to get more into the areas identified and how they're very specific. So we're talking about any water bodies, wetlands, unique sites, camp leases, municipalities, even areas that aren't currently mapped. If we go into an area and harvest, uh, uh, we call them harvest blocks. You hear that harvest block referenced a lot. That's an area in which we harvest. And we find, an un sometimes we find unmapped brooks, so something that we didn't previously know was there. We identify that, we apply the appropriate buffer on that area, and then we make sure that information is passed on to the province so herbicide application areas are, are properly identified and we know uh, we, we, we identify these areas. I think that's very important to understand. I um, also want to, you know, inform the, the committee that we don't plant, we don't plant where we can't treat. So, um, specific to uh, residences or camp leases, um, municipalities, we have specific buffer zones that we're required to stay away from certain areas. So, for example, a, a residence, is you know we're required to stay upwards of 500 meters away from that re uh, away from that residence, so we're trying not to put plantations closer to those residents, which then would have a potential uh, impact uh, by needing to spray that area. Um, so no different than if there's a, a buffer on a camp lease, um, we're we're allowed to harvest up to the camp lease, but. By no means would we plant trees up to that camp lease because we're trying to minimize any potential impact of needing to apply herbicide to that plantation in the future. Um, you know, I feel like we're lucky in New Brunswick that the harvested area, 67% uh, or two thirds comes back naturally. And, and the other 30% that we need to help promote um, is important. I feel that every tree in New, Brun in New Brunswick has has an objective, and some have more than one objective on it. And that's important to understand. We, we, uh, we talk about other provinces and what they're doing. Um, I think fundamentally New Brunswick is different. Uh, every tree in New Brunswick is counted for, and that's different than other provinces. And because of that, we do put uh, uh, a lot of pressure on the, on the resource. Um, but as a forester in New Brunswick, um, I feel like we manage those objectives, manage those pressures uh, to the best of our ability. Just, just uh, sorry, I shouldn't have, uh, maybe I'll just back up, there you go, glad that worked. 
Um, a couple more points. So, you know, planting softwood trees like spruce is done to regrow the forest where softwood trees were. Um, hardwood trees like maple or birch do not need to be planted to regrow effectively. They're, those are not the areas we're talking about. Um, herbicides are still, you know, we feel that herbicides are an effective tool to control the vegetation that competes with the planted trees. Mike mentioned this and I just want to reiterate it, the herbicide only is used once or twice in the 40 year life cycle of the planted area, which is that small 0.3% of the land base annually. Um, again, not all New Brunswick is the same. I want to help the, uh, the group understand that. So if, if at a landscape level, it's all the trees, uh, the, the way our forest looks throughout New Brunswick, it's, it's not the same. You have large hardwood dominated areas in the north. You have some upland central areas which are dominated by softwood, softwood areas. And, and then you have mixed wood stands that are throughout the province. Um, you know, Mike had mentioned that the company he works for is a hardwood user, a predominant hardwood user. The company I work for is a predominant softwood user. Uh, as a licensed manager for the Crown, um, you know, we have upwards of 20 facilities that consume different products and need different types of species. And as a forest manager, that's what I actively do on a daily basis, is try to make sure that the volume, the, the allocations that are allotted to those facilities, that they're out there. Um, just maybe my last point I'd want to make is, you know, from a, a, a land manager's perspective, I believe we're, we're growing more wood than we ever have, um, which is also allowing us to, to meet some other objectives. It's, a, it's really, we have the opportunity in New Brunswick, unlike other provinces, to um, meet both of those needs. Thanks. Thank you for your presentation. First up, we'll have questions from the official opposition. Madame Landry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Merci beaucoup. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, nice to hear all those numbers, and I have some questions uh, regarding exactly those numbers. If you say that 6.1, uh, how do you call that, million Me, uh, hectares, hectare uh, of forest covered, three million of that is crown lines. Is that correct? Okay. And then 1.3 percent of New Brunswick forest is being harvested each year. So how much of that 1.3 percent is on crown lines? I believe your question is all of the 1.3 percent we're referencing is all on crown line correct so we could just take a look at the slide again okay. just for reference so we we had referenced the 6.1 million hectares is the forested area oh, yes right? so Sorry, those I'll back up one even more so 7.3 million hectares is the area of new brunswick the entire area yes 7.1 million hectares Okay, so 7.1 million hectares is the, the area where the uh, forested area. Okay, so go ahead, Mike, here. Okay, so it's the 1.3% the that's harvested is the entire province. That's the entire. So that's private land, everything. it's uh, Freehold, everything. Crown, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So and that's, it's an important point to make because it's, people want to know what's happening throughout the entire province. Yeah. Okay. A and is it that same percentage applied to uh, crown lines? Do, do you harvest more crown lands than private and uh, industry? Yes, there is more. Okay, so how much more? Uh, I think uh, the breakdown right now is probably about 50% from crown and 50%. And it's about 50 50 crown private. Crown private, private, including private land. That's uh, right. And the private would be divided into private industrial yes. freehold, which the companies own, and yes. then small private. Okay. But 50% of that 1.3% is That's from right. land. Um, you said also that 80% of that is clear cutting. How much of that clear cutting is done on crown land? Is that mostly on crown land or on private lot owners and uh, industry freehold? On crown, 80% would apply. Yeah. The 80% would yes. apply on yeah. crown land. So. Um, 
So if 80% is clear cut, 67% uh, is naturally regener regenerated, uh, and only 33% is artificially regenerated, <laughs> and that's where the glyphosate is applied. Um, when and why do you need application of herbicide? How do you decide that? That's a question for the forester. He, he would make those decisions. Yeah. Is there more foliage? Is there... Yes. So, so. Or, or is there a better return on the harvest or the potential harvest in the future? So, so all of the, after the areas are harvested, um, we physically go out in the field and, and, and identify what areas need some help, need to be planted, versus the two-thirds of the area that New, uh, in New Brunswick is naturally regenerating on its own, right? So it's, it's, there's already mixed species coming back. Somewhat, sometimes it's, it's softwood species as well, uh, but those areas are coming back naturally. So the areas that aren't coming back or aren't doing as well and need, um, need some intervention, uh, you're right, we go out and inspect those areas and then understand if we do put uh, planted trees in the ground, um, also inspect whether or not they're, they're dealing with competition levels, if they're dealing with species that, um, that are competing for the resource, competing for the nutrients of the site, and, and those are the areas which we're applying herbicide to. Okay. Do you do more applications of uh, herbicides on crown land than on privately owned woodlands and uh, industry free oak? Yes. yes. Yes? What percentage? Well, I, we're referencing the, the percentage of, of crown, which is uh, the two thirds that is naturally regenerating and the one third that is needing um, some, some, Help. some planted trees to be put in, right? That, that's the crown number we're referencing. Okay, and who regulates and monitor the application? You said you follow uh, specific, um, you know, standards. Yes. Um, and who monitors if the application has been done accordingly? So the we we as a as a as a licensed manager for the province, we identify the areas we believe need to be treated. That information is then communicated to the province, and the province is is uh, is applying the treatment. Okay. monitoring the treatment and I hope who, that answers your question yeah <laughs> maybe I can add, add to yes it because it, it, the, it the the, uh, the the process that Andy described is, is correct that's where it would start and, and would land in, in DNR's hands but at that point the applicator uh, so the applicator that would be hired to actually do the, the spraying they have to be permitted they have to be licensed uh, licenses and permits have to be obtained from uh, Department of Environment. So, Department of Environment and, and uh, Department of uh, Natural Resources and Energy would be the two departments that would be responsible for approving the areas to be sprayed from a forest management plan, and then Environment would, would be responsible for the, the application permits and such. And I would like to know who pays for the applications on Crown Lands? The landowner. The landowner, so the landowner being the province, it's the province that pays for that. And what about applications on private lands and freehold? The landowner. The landowner. Thank you. That uh, will pass to my um, colleague if you want to recognize. Uh, no worries. No. Thank you, Mr. Leblanc. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Merci beaucoup. Thank you for your presentation, both uh, Mr. Barrio and Mr. Ogier. I appreciate you this morning being here. Uh, a lot of good facts. I have, I've got some questions. I maybe want to continue. We're here about high, We're here for for uh, the uh, the herbicide spraying, and I think that's the main concern here this morning. Mr. Barrio, you talked about um, basically that industry. You guys go out. You identify where it needs to be applied, and um, it, it seems to me it's controlled by, by the industry and not by the regulator. And you, you kind of referenced how it was being done, but I get a sense that as a taxpayer in New Brunswick, there's not a whole lot that we have to say. You guys tell, tell, the, tell the government how it works and we pay for it and you guys apply it. And, 
I think you need to be a little bit more specific in, 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 in how the whole thing is being done because I, I think that there's a, you know, yesterday in a few days we've had comments about wildlife uh, that weren't being considered or, or, or being, you know, there needs to be a little bit more uh, tender love and care for, for the wildlife, buffers, streams, water courses, etc. Like, can you, for the committee purpose, go into detail in how exactly everything is being considered before application uh, and, and permits are being done? Yes, so there, there's, there's currently a, uh, there's detailed information which we could provide to the committee which outlines what you're actually going to the field to look at to determine whether, um, whether the area needs to be treated or not, right? So those are specific height requirements, uh, densities of, of species that you are looking to take out of the area. There's, there's, there's best management practices that are in place. It's not, it's not just an opinion uh, versus somebody else's opinion. We have parameters, best management practices in place when we identify those areas. In, in reference to its industry identifying the areas and then uh, the Crown uh, applying product on the areas we identify, uh, you know, I don't feel like that's the case. There's, if there was a... Uh, if there was an instance in which the applicator, who which, which is certified, who, who has the appropriate training, um, they would not simply, they are not simply applying or treating areas that we, um, that we identify. Okay. We're submitting areas to the Crown to be treated, and they're being approved by the Crown to be treated in reference to the best management practices. So I hope that gives some more clarity yeah. to... So to, so, to the process. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. And I'm uh, sure you can give us more in detail information, submit some, some information. My last question is, you know it's a contentious issue. We're all aware of that. Other jurisdictions have uh, made some decisions to, uh, to ban it. And I'd like you to, to tell us uh, how the forest management is being done differently in Quebec compared to New Brunswick. That's a very good question, and it's come up, you know, throughout the entire day. And uh, quite, quite simply, the simple answer is you're dealing with different forests. Uh, in Atlantic Canada, we have an Acadian forest stand type. Uh, in Quebec, it's more boreal, uh, with the exception of some small strips down the, in the, in the south southern part of the province, near Beauce in that area. The same as you're looking, if you look, uh, if you if you look at, at, at other provinces within the Atlantic region much more similar, Nova Scotia, for example. So then you get, into two, you get into two debates there. One is the forest area is different. It's fundamentally different, so it has to be treated differently. And then number two, it depends on the, the policy and the jurisdiction you're in. So in Quebec, as we all know, they ban the use of herbicide. And we must be you know, specific on this. They ban the use of herbicide on crown land. It can still be used on private woodlots. It can still be used for industrial purposes, rail lines, hydro. The product isn't banned. It's banned for use on Crown land. Now, what's the consequence of that? The stories you've heard to date say they're doing it in Quebec. They're planting a larger tree. They're using mechanical thinning. Yes, that's, that is an option. You can do that. But there's a consequence to doing that. And Quebec's paying the price for that now. The, 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 the price they're paying, and this isn't my words, this is the words of the chief forester of Quebec himself. Not just one, two of the past chief foresters have said the same thing. They've given up intensive management, or haven't applied intensive management enough, and they're running into a wood supply problem. Now they have an objective here to double their wood supply, their AEC to their mills, over the next 60 years. That's in their forestry strategy. That's a significant increase. If we came and announced that here, it, it, would, be, it would be chaos. So, how do you get there? Well, you've got to intensify your, your forest management, and they haven't. They've been using more extensive forest management, going further out to get wood, increasing the footprint, and now they have a problem. Now, I can't say, I can't say it's a cause and effect that they stopped using herbicide in 2001, and then suddenly they had failed plantations. But that did happen. They have failed plantations. And it's significant. Plantations that have 15% failure, and by failure I mean they're not completely dead, but they didn't meet their restocking objectives, which is in Quebec, you need to have 60% of 
success in your restocking on a, on a block that you've, re that you've replanted. So it goes everywhere from 15 to 56% failure. Now that's a significant amount of loss. If we applied those losses to our plantations here, that would be half a million cubic meters of wood that we wouldn't have. That's the wood that Schiller Sawmill consumes. That's a mill of business. So we don't have the luxury of drawing a line above the Plaster Rock Renews Highway and saying, let's throw all that into conservation. We're a small province. We really have to make use of, all, of what we have. And that's what's tricky here in New Brunswick. We ask a lot of the forests, and we ask a lot of the forest managers when it comes to managing for multiple objectives. We don't have the luxury to say, let's go further north. Everything's managed, to Andy's point. We know where every tree is. We know the purpose it serves. It could be serving a conservation purpose. It could be serving a fiber supply purpose. It could be serving a recreational purpose. It's tough to do forestry in New Brunswick partly because of our size. And we have a very different forest. Uh, yeah. Suspi, Nancy. Um, Mr. Kuhn, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning to you both. Um, so it got me thinking, uh, given the title of your presentation, um, with respect to what you're calling forest renewal and, and uh, vegetation <clears throat> management. Um, essentially, through decisions around harvesting uh, and then the particular um, other civil cultural measures that are taken after harvesting. Mr. Cook, can you speak up a bit or is there a headphone that can help? Oh, yeah, okay. Thank you. I can't see now, I can't hear either. So. Yeah, it's a problem, I know. I wore the thinnest but still protective mask I could find. <laughs> Good, thank you. Yeah, I, I had to dispense. My neighbor makes me these great masks, very protective, but you can't hear a darn thing through them, so I use these. Anyway, um, thank goodness for neighbors. I, uh, yeah, so just to start over, you, the, because you're, you're, the title of your presentation is Forest Renewal and, and Vegetation Management, it got me to thinking. Um, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, yeah. very good. Got me thinking about this. Um, uh, when, you know, harvesting type, the type of harvesting you're done is going to have some influence on what that uh, significant influence on what that forest community, all its elements, looks like. I'm talking not just about the trees, but the understory and so on. Um, because ecologically, you think of forest communities, not individual trees uh, sitting, standing there with other individual trees. Uh, it's kind of an interactive whole. Um, and we know we certainly have lost, according to the Atlantic Data Center, Conservation Data Center, or at least at high risk, our six, seven, eight different forest community types across the New Brunswick landscape now. Um, so harvesting has an impact. Uh, additional silvicultural interventions you might make have an impact. You're picking winners and losers in terms of the particular species that are regrowing through, uh, through uh, uh, whether you're doing spacing or, or, or thinning or, or, uh, or converting to a plantation. Um, and it got me to think about, uh, got me to thinking about uh, the impact of, of global heating on what you're doing. Um, the Canadian Forest Service has done quite a bit of work uh, and more recently field work uh, which uh, in New Brunswick is indicating that there will be a negative effect on the abundance of softwood, specifically spruces and fir, uh, because regeneration will, will not be as, uh, as effective as before, but it will favor hardwoods um, like maple and, and birch in terms of regeneration. So as forest, uh, we, there's, you've got one forest manager, manager here, so what is the thinking about um, you know, that we're going to see this over the next few decades. So what is the thinking about uh, how forest management needs to adapt to the direct impacts of global heating on, on uh, what's happening in the woods in terms of regeneration? And that's a very good question. And it's, uh, it's I know Dr. Anthony Taylor at CFS has done a lot of that work on, uh, on modeling uh, future 
future uh, conditions for for native species. And look, it's it's a big concern. It's a very big concern for the forest product sector. Um, you know, for for me as a hardwood user, I, you might think I'd be jumping for joy that we're going to have a, a, a more greater abundance of hardwood species for for us to manage. But that's not that's not the case. Uh, we have to keep a balance with our softwood users as well. Uh, we we do consume also a small portion of softwood in uh, in, in our pulping process, but you know it, it's it definitely it's focused on hardwood. So, you know, in order to keep that balance, we have to find uh, adaptive measures with regards to uh, trying to maintain a you know a, a, a diverse. Um, representation of softwood species stands in, in the province, not only for wood fiber purposes, but obviously for, for ecological and, uh, and habitat. Many species require dominant conifer stands for, for habitat. So some of the work that's being done right now, I know at the University of New Brunswick, is they're looking at uh, adaptive migration. So we're looking at, uh, at species of conifers, um, I think specifically about four species, uh, that are uh, so they're conspecific. They're growing in the in the in the U.S. South, uh, not as far south as Florida, but you're getting into New Hampshire, uh, in, into those areas that are bordering the eastern seaboard further south. And we're trying to see if we can adaptively move these into our planting programs into into New Brunswick, because it's only there is a couple of degrees difference between those ecosystems down there where those species are growing and the ones in New Brunswick. And we think we might be able to adapt them in the future. And uh, and improve the improve the stands that way. So, uh, I agree with you, Mr. Kuhn. It is it is a serious concern, not only from a ecological perspective, but from from an industry perspective all around. It's just something I'd like to add to that, if I can. Sure, please. You know, I think the the important thing to note is that the forest management we do is is with you know the most current information we have, and uh, we don't really put forest management on the shelf and then go out and start harvesting areas. When new information arises, uh, changes in environments occur, these are conversations we continually have. And I, you know, I, I really, you probably know that there's a five-year management cycle, but really, even in with, within that five years, we, we're always continually um, discussing changes, one like this, uh, with, the, with the province, and trying to understand how it's affecting uh, the forest we're trying to grow. So just um, so when you, uh, in terms of management, what's the time frame you're managing for, or what people call the rotation period? The current management plans are designed over a 80-year time horizon, but there a, a new management plan is is applied every five years in New Brunswick, um, and, and really I, I think it's it's not fair to say that only decisions are made every five years. Um, there's an open communication between licensees, the Crown managers, and, and, and the Crown. Um, so I, I, want the, I want the community to understand that it's not just something that's looked at once every five years. It's, it's a continuous conversation. Certainly with an 80-year planning horizon, we're talking about the period for sure within which dramatic changes will occur in the forest as a result of global heating and its impacts locally in New Brunswick on just about everything. Um, so, uh, one of the things that could happen is the landowner um, may decide that we've got to uh, do more to increase the uh, supply of, say, tolerant hardwoods uh, over that 80-year period. Um, what kind of impact would that have on, uh, on the softwood production? That, that's something that's modeled, and we try to understand how, how that would occur. Uh, the, the, the complicated part with managing forests is um, they don't stay the same. They, they grow over time. We have uh, environmental events that occur, whether it's a windstorm or, uh, or you know, maybe a, a drought, which has significantly impacted a plantation. There's multiple variables that happen. Um, so. Um, Specific to your question, uh, you know, that's the, the impact of that on softwood, for example, or other species. Um, we work with the province to try to model that and understand what the impact would be on, on the other species. But would there be, um, if the landowner, the province decided, say, landowner, 
First Nations haven't ceded the land, but that was your language I'm using, I guess. Uh, if on Crown lands, the pro province decided that uh, the best bet would be to, to start uh, managing four taller hardwoods in a way to significantly increase their supply to the degree that it's so culturally possible, um, what kind of impact would that have on the softwood supply? Uh, so yep, go ahead. I mean, that's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's still speculative, although I, I do appreciate the work that uh, scientists like Dr. Taylor have done. So we're, we're talking about a, you know, a hypothetical situation here. Um, so to answer your question, Mr. Kuhn, I, I think what I, would, what I would consider an appropriate approach would be to, as I described, try to look at, at ways that we could adapt those species currently. Uh, I don't think uh, Dr. Taylor anticipated a complete collapse of the softwood stands in the province at a particular point. It would be gradual uh, if, in fact, that happens. A lot of things can happen between now and then. We could start to meet some climate change objectives, which we're fully supportive of, and we think forestry has a very good solution to that. So we could see some, some, some moderation in the shift from uh, the current state to a future state that's been described as you know, hardwood, more hardwood dominant. Uh, that would be a good thing. Um, or if that was not the case, I suspect we may need to even look at even more intensive management because we may need to start to replace those plantations with, uh, that we have now with uh, adaptive species. So it wouldn't really increase the footprint any. We're not looking to do that. We just would have to change the, the species that we're, that we're planting 80 years down the road. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Conroy, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, for coming today and, and uh, being here to answer our questions. Um, we've talked many times in the past and shared my concerns, and you guys were always very willing and open to, uh, to speak about it. I've never uh, pretended to understand the logistics or the stats and all that stuff behind it, but as many of us are just con concerned citizens of, of what's happening. Around, um, you know, glyphosate spraying and the clear cutting and the power of industry and all of that that uh, you hear on a da daily basis. Um, you know, traveling through the woods, we do see, and I've mentioned this to you before, about a lot of clear cutting and uh, the, the number of clear cutting and the number of roads um, now that we see that we, you know, didn't see years ago. So, um, and talking to people out and, and, and about and the same thing, you know, a lot of people share the same concerns. Um, when, when we go for we land and in large clear cuts, sometimes um, you see only one or two big pines left or big trees left. Um, are these areas considered clear cuts or are they considered tree harvesting? Where do you, where do you put them in? I can take that. So those, those white pine there's, or other species you see there, that, that area is still considered a clear cut. So, so considered clear cut? The, the clear cut doesn't necessarily mean that all of the trees were taken off an area. So white pine, for example, sometimes it's uh, uh, a limited market for the, the white pine that might be on that site. Um, Maybe um, you know, there, just, there, there wasn't a need to harvest it at that time, so there is some left throughout, scattered throughout the harvest area. But to be clear, that area would still be uh, calculated as, as being clear-cut okay. and, and, and documented as being clear-cut. Okay, thank you. Um, can you explain a little bit of who your members are, about your organization, where it's funded, and things like that? Sure. I mean, I didn't want to dwell too much on that in the introduction, but if, if, if you'd like I to know more, more time. <laughs> well, no problem. Uh, look, the, the association represents, uh, f well, we have 40, 40 member companies. Uh, 15 of those would be what we call primary producers, so they're, they're companies that take a log and transform it into something. And then the other remaining members would be people in the, in the supply chain that have obviously a vested interest in the industry and, and are members of the association. Um, we're funded uh, exclusively by the members uh, on membership dues, and um, that's uh, you know we really our role is to be is to be advocates for the sector. Uh, we represent the, the sector before before government and before the, the public. All right, um, Mike, you recently stepped down as as the executive director. Um, can you shed a little light on why or how that transpired? 
I can. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it was just a career change, a good opportunity to move with, with AV Group, a lot of similar, similar work. Um, I, you know, I basically thought I had accomplished what I set out to do with the association. Uh, it was an excellent organization to work with. I think we really moved the bar in terms of, of being able to, to open dialogue with, with other stakeholders. Uh, look, everybody that presented here over the week, uh, you might think that we're, we're uh, vehement opponents and at each other's throats. That's not the case. Uh, you know, I can sit and have a conversation with, with Lois Corbett. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Mrs. Lubadarcy, you know, we don't see eye to eye on, 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 on the philosophy there, but you know what, at the end of the day, I have, I have respect for people that are passionate about their cause and, and we have no issue with that. And I think that's, that's a significant accomplishment for the association over the last seven years. Absolutely, and the same thing as here. We have our different views, but yes. at the end of the day, we're all trying to accomplish the same thing and what's better for the province. So I totally get that. Um, on your website, um, you have a, a page on your website on glyphosate impacts to deer and moose. Who authors this page? I'm not sure if that's on the Forest NB website. Is it on the Forest Info website, perhaps? Forest Info, I think. Right. So those, the content of Forest Info would have been, um, would have been submitted by... Uh, by qualified scientists. Uh, it certainly wasn't Mike Legere. I mean, I'm a biologist by training, but I certainly, what I know about deer biology is, is quite limited. So that would have been possibly, at the time, Dr. Thompson with the Canadian Forestry Service. Uh, it may have been, um, it may have been uh, others within the department that contributed. It could have been the DNR deer biologist. I, all I know is it wasn't me, but uh, it was certainly a, a qualified individual who had expertise in that area. On a page, um, it mentions that deer rely on fur, on fur in, the, in the winter. And we heard from a former biologist yesterday that says on his, his, his expertise, the fur seldom is eaten by the deer, and, uh, and if it is, it's a starvation food. And he also mentioned the studies cited for his statements are incorrect. Um, will this, can this be altered on your page, or is, if it's, you know, from another... You know, I, I would think that if, if, uh, if the former presenter, it was Mr. Cumberland, I presume, if he has to, an issue to take with, the, with the, the content, he should take it up with the author, and I'd be more than happy to, pre to present him the, the, uh, the, uh, who the author is, and he can keep in contact with him and, and question it. Uh, look, it's, you know, I, I, I know that he has taken Dr. Thompson to task at public hearings before, uh, you know, Dr. Thompson is a, is, a, is a retired scientist now. He retired a number of years ago. But at the time, he was a well-respected, uh, well-published scientist, an expert in environmental toxicology. And he would know how to source the appropriate literature and reference it. Uh, I, would have no, uh, you know, I would have no doubt that he, is, he, has, uh, he has conducted himself appropriately in, in the literature he's chosen to cite to, to make those, those statements. Again, if it was Dr. Thompson that offered it could have been someone else, and I certainly would, would, uh, would encourage Mr. Cumberland to contact them and, and, and have that debate. We will pass that along. Thank you. Um, have you read the 2017 Health Canada reassessment of glyphosate or the IR IARC uh, monograph evaluation of the carcinogenic risk of glyphosate? And can you explain the, the differences? Yes, I, I have. Um, I am not a, again, a environmental toxicologist, so me reading it is, it's a, it's a cursory view. Uh, the IARC I, I read in some detail, and uh, look, at the end of the day, the, the IARC report released in 2015 uh, assessed a, a hazard. Uh, they assess hazard for many, many products. Their determination was that it was a type 2A carcinogen, uh, there's a long list of type 2A carcinogens, uh, and that's, that's the risk assessment, uh, or the hazard assessment, excuse me. The risk assessment is completely different, and actually a sister organization to IARC, which is JMPR, is uh, also under, under the World Health Organization. They assess risk, and they came to a completely different conclusion than, uh, than IARC. To the point where the Director General of the World Health Organization had to actually step in and say, look folks, you know, we can't have two diverging opinions coming out of the same organization, and said, let's go back and have a look at the entire body of work on glyphosate. Peer-reviewed, non-peer-reviewed, industry, uh, uh, third-party uh, delivered, let's look at everything. 
And at the end of the day, she said, fine, we're not changing our opinion. IRX maintains that it's a type 2A carcinogen in their hazard assessment. Uh, the Joint uh, Pesticide Residue Management Committee decided in terms of the actual practical use of the product, no, it does not pose a excessive risk to, to human health. I'm comfortable with that. Well, I think um, more study needs to be done, you know, with, the, with glyphosate. <laughs> All, all other countries, all other, everywhere else seems to do these big studies, and especially with the concern and stuff behind it. You know, our big, my biggest concern is there's no studies. There's no studies of if it's in the waters, if it's in the food, if it's in the dust that we're inhaling when we're driving along the trails. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, um, the, 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 the difference between a study and monitoring. Listen, I don't disagree with some of the comments from past presenters that maybe we should be monitoring for this. <clears throat> studies, it's been studied to death. Mm -hmm. And I really don't think that there's, there's a whole lot of room for, and there might be some novel ideas about glyphosate. I have no problem if somebody wants to take that up and, and study. Um, but look, right now, the current, the current scientific literature on this, it's not, it's not, a, it's not insignificant. You're never going to get a unanimous consensus in science. You shouldn't. You should always have some dissenting opinion. But the overwhelming body of evidence is currently still saying that as a, as a hazard, as a, uh, sorry, as a risk to human health, really not there. And we talk about long-term studies. Now, long-term studies with regard to, uh, with regard to the, the glyphosate based in formulation, I heard multiple people erroneously state that there has been no test on glyphosate in formulation. That is patently false. I mean, I can give you a list here of, of, uh, of studies that looked at it in formulation and outside of formulation. And going back to, I just in one sampling, back to 2000, Williams in 2000 looked at glyphosate in formulation, concluded that there was no, no, uh, no carcinogen, carcinogenic, that's a tough word in French, mm -hmm. for, a little, for a Frenchman, it's hard for, hard for me to pronounce that. No uh, carcinogenic properties to glyphosate in formulation. It was studied again by uh, uh, DeRousse in 2005. You want to talk about big studies. That was the agricultural health study in the U.S., and it's long-term. It followed agricultural workers in the United States, and you've heard this by other presenters who are arguably the most exposed to pesticides, and they looked at it. That's been running for over 25 years, tens of thousands of people in this epidemiological study, and the conclusion has come out over and over again out of that study, and as recently back in 2019, 20, 20, that it was it concluded that there is no observable effect, and specifically with, with regards to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a, a cancer particularly uh, connected to, to glyphosate use. And, and that study is the largest study of its kind in, in, in North America for sure, if not in the world. Your time is uh, concluded. Over to the government side, Minister Holland, you have 10, I guess you all have 10 minutes to ask your questions. Mr. Legere, Mr. Berrio, thank you for coming here today. Appreciate your presentation. Uh, there's a couple of things that I wanted to, I have questions, but um, there was a couple of things you brought up. When we were talking yesterday and there was conversations about no studies related to the, con, uh, the, the combination of, of glyphosate as well as the adjuvants and the surfactants. That really did concern me because something in and of itself could be one thing, but uh, that really caught my attention. If, you have, if, if there's information about that and, and uh, we were told there was an absence of information, I want to find that out because that did concern me yesterday. If you could provide that and I think you'd also agreed to provide the committee uh, best management practices as well. I would just affirm the desire to see that brought to the committee. And um, Mr. LeBlanc talked briefly about Quebec, but I want to talk about jurisdictions elsewhere. Like we, we've had conversations about how uh, herbicide is required, it's needed, uh, we would have problems without it. But I want to ask you just, just quite frankly, surely there's jurisdictions that operate with a viable economically uh, sustainable forestry method without herbicide and and so when we talk about that why is you why would New Brunswick be so unique or, and or can you point to other areas that are economically viable because uh, I have a hard time believing that 
that we need that exclusively here to be successful in New Brunswick, uh, and there must be other areas that, that, that are viable without it. Could you help me understand that? You want me to jump in? Yeah. Okay. Okay. The um, is you know there are jurisdictions that do it differently, and again it goes back to the fact that those jurisdictions have different types of forests. Uh, we can look, uh, look look at Scandinavia, uh, the Swedes and the the uh, the, the Norwegians. Uh, sorry, the Finns and the Norwegians definitely have a very big forest industry, and their use of glyphosate is not as high as what we have in New Brunswick. Why is that? Uh, it's not that it's never been used. It's, it's just that they are probably 200 years ahead of us in terms of silviculture. Are you saying that if we improve our silviculture, we would eliminate the need for herbicide? You could certainly see a reduction over the long term. But keep in mind, silviculture has been exercised in Scandinavia for... Well, where, where, where are they that, that light years ahead? Could you well, give some examples yes. of that? So you have a boreal forest, more of a boreal type forest in those countries. Uh, so dominated by really two species of, of, uh, of conifer and uh, paper birch in particular. And over the years, as you cultivate these stands, you, you do create a certain amount of, of shading effect. You do increase the acidity of the soil. And you know you can see you can see examples of that now, and Andy could probably speak to that in, in, conifer, in some conifer plantations, where you get to the point where it becomes inhospitable for for uh, for vegetation you know, that you don't want there sure. to grow. But again, it, it's it's a question of time, the timeline in those in those particular yeah. Scandinavian countries, the nature of the forest. I'm not saying that would, that would uh, necessarily work here in New Brunswick because we do have a very different forest type. But yeah, there, there is, there is some, some possibility that, that some aspects of that could work. W would you be able to provide us with narratives in other jurisdictions, uh, albeit light years ahead, but mm. what they're doing? Would you be able to gather some data and research on that for the committee? Certain, certain yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the other side of that thing is that um, I, I, I am not an economist. I'm not a scientist, uh, and, and we heard a lot about the fact that that the economy, the economic benefit of using a herbicide far outweighs other methods of managing that. Uh, we've got 24,000 jobs here in the, in the supply chain right now, and as we're emerging from a pandemic, employment is going to be something that we need to really focus on, bringing us back to normal, bringing people back to work. How like? How can we employ our human resources and, and get more people working in the woods and employ them in those different methods of vegetation management? There's got to be a way that we can economically do it and build jobs. What would you, what would you say to that? We are economically doing it now. The, the model works. Um, you know, at the end of the day, one of the reasons we use glyphosate-based herbicides is it's, it's very cost, it's cost, it's an effective product. And, and it's 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 regular, you know, from a regulatory perspective, it's acceptable. It, it ticks off a lot of boxes. It has a very good environmental profile, certainly compared to previous products that have been used. And you know, there's been a lot of talk about DDT and uh, and 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. And you know, back when those products were used, a lot of it was used for defoliation and also for for insect control. Those are the best products they had at the time. And look, make no mistake, they did not have a good environmental profile. That's why when we talk about a product like glyphosate, it has, it's so far ahead of those products <coughs> that it's, it's become, uh, it's become, that's why it's become the go-to product. Now, from a cost perspective, you know, I've heard people say, well, could you tomorrow turn the switch off, stop using glyphosate and employ, uh, you know, put people to work, boots on the ground, thinning socks? It's a very good question. Um, sure, my company, has a 30% gap right now in trying to find silviculture workers. I've got money to spend on silviculture and I don't have bodies to do it. I, I wish I did, but I don't. Uh, secondly, I would rather use those people to go in and do, do thinning exercises in stands that are already established. That's a much better use of, the, of that particular, uh, particular worker. Yeah, that resource. Um, so, you know, if I was, again, if I flicked that switch off and stopped using it and could find the bodies to do it, it would, Increase the cost tenfold. 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 
And okay. I, you know, I, I don't know a business model that can accept that sort of, of an increase in cost, especially when, in our opinion, we have a product that it, it makes it makes absolutely no business sense to abandon it. Following up on comments that Mr. Kuhn made about uh, global heating, the impact on forestry, our boreal forest, we're seeing that range move northerly. You know, I've, I've been concerned about that as well. Um, and then I appreciated the answers to talk about the work that's being done on adapted migration. Um, but in all of that work, is anybody asking, well, what if this doesn't work? Are we, are we doing that to just grip and hang on to our model because it's our model? And, and, and we're talking about something that if it doesn't work, um, is anybody looking at that saying like, if that, if, if we can't, if, if adapted migration doesn't work, we're in trouble. Are we just doing that because that's what we always do? And that's the model we have. And we're going to try to grip that all the way into the ground. I'm worried about that. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's certainly concerning. I mean, you want to make sure you have a contingency plan. And as I outlined to Mr. Kuhn's similar question, you know, if if uh, if it was me and I had uh, all the you know the, the jurisdictional power in the world to direct DNR where they where I think they should go, uh, I would say, look, you know, let's continue down the right track with our our, our climate change. Uh, agenda, reducing our greenhouse gas effects, the role forestry plays in that. That to me is, is, is really, you know, first and foremost, because we could turn the thing around and not have a, a, a you know, a very significant change in our, in our forest, uh, in our forest uh, stand structure in the province. Plan B, well, maybe we should, you know, continue to see whether this adaptive uh, migration of tree species can be slowly introduced into our planting rotations, test it, see if it works, see if those those species, they're not different species, they're just in a different region. They're, they're you know, I guess you could say it's almost the same as a plant being hardened off to, to go out into a, into a garden. So continue with that work, see if that could, could provide a, a solution as well. Um, the other thing is we, you know, look, if we run up against a brick wall and none of these things work, Andy might have some troubles. Yeah, okay. AV group, maybe not so much. But, you know, at the end of the day, that's not the direction we want to take. We want to maintain this balance across the province of species. We want to do everything we can to keep that diversity in product and species. Uh, and again, I'm speaking selfishly as from an industrial perspective, but it's obvious from an ecological perspective it's, it's important as well. Well, we've heard a lot over the last couple of days about a myopic view of managing the forest for the purpose of, uh, of a spruce or a fir or to a lesser degree jack pine. And, and you know, there's been a lot of concerns of folks saying that because we got that focus, you know, we're, we're missing broader or more diverse areas or the, what we've done to get there and the, and the damage that that's done to, to the land base. But, you know, when you were putting up your slide about 1% or 2% of the forest that's cut every year, um, and we've heard people showing maps from back in the 80s and stuff like that, you start to do some math and you start to think in 50, 1 to 2%, 50 or 100 years, like how, that's a problem for the land base because it's not a small dot then. It could just, and that math just doesn't work for me. So can you explain that a little bit more? Because that's very concerning. I've been to presentations where the presenters put up maps which show harvested areas and then show harvested areas the next year and the next year and over multiple years. Um, yeah, we've you know, seen the, them this week. Yeah. The, you know, the good story is, is the, the, the first areas that are put up, well, they are regenerating naturally or have been uh, artificially regenerated. You know, as a forester in New Brunswick, uh, unproductive area is very concerning because you want that area to be able to grow and successfully meet an objective, whether it's a lumber objective or a habitat objective or maybe it's specific to a unique area or, 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 uh, or some other, some other cons going concern. Um, so you know, the, the idea that over time uh, the land base is being harvested uh, and, and harvested on an unsustainable level is just simply not, not true. That was concluded. Gentlemen, thank you very much for appearing and uh, making the presentation to our committee this morning. I'll give you an opportunity to make any conclu concluding comments that you may wish. I'm just going to start with one uh, clarification issue that I've heard through the week. 
and it's specific to clear cuts and clear cut size. Um, are they getting bigger? Are they getting smaller? Um, so as a land manager, we're allowed to harvest up to 200 hectares. Um, the reality is clear cuts in New Brunswick are much smaller than that. So when I reference areas that are planted and then they need to be herbicided, they're not of that magnitude. Uh, 20 to 30 hectares is the majority of clear cut sizes. And uh, let's be honest, as a New Brunswicker, I have not seen a, a pretty looking clear cut yet, right? They, they don't look good. You cannot make them aesthetically pleasing. The idea that we go in and harvest all of those species when we're there uh, doesn't leave somewhere that is uh, representative where you'd want to go for a walk or, or take a look at. Um, and, and the idea of why do we see so many of these clear cuts? Well, the, the roads that are built to access that volume are, were built by the forest industry. Um, and that's why a lot of those roads that are good roads or areas you can access because they're accessing the timber that's there. So just want to be, uh, and, and whether clear cut size is going to get bigger or smaller, I think it really has to do with the management of our forest and how plantations are growing and natural areas are growing and, and they may get bigger in the future, not actually smaller. So it's, it really depends on the forest that we have and the areas we're consuming. Yeah, and just the last point for me is, uh, Look, I, I, do, I do agree with, with past presenters who've made the final comment that you have a, you have a, a large responsibility, responsibility here to, to deliver something that, uh, that the public feels needs to be done, and uh, we certainly respect that. We also respect the fact that we, we want to maintain the ability to contribute to the economy of the province. It's important. We are the single biggest private sector contributor to the economy of the province, and uh, that's, that's a big responsibility uh, on top of having to manage all the other objectives that are there. I do want to really commend the committee for the way they put this together. I think uh, you did a very good job selecting representative groups here. Uh, if you can make a comparison to what was done in Quebec uh, pre-2000 with the uh, BAP, the Bureau d'audience publique, uh, on, on, uh, sur l'environnement, it was a very large public consultation. Uh, they found it, you know, for them, it was, they thought it was a successful way to, to deal with that issue. I disagree. I think it allowed too much for populist opinion rather than fact to rule the day. And I think that's why Quebec is in the situation they are right now. Uh, as I mentioned, they, they've got a problem. They want more wood and they don't have it because they made a choice. Uh, I think we have a choice to make here as well. Um, people have made recommendations. I'm not going to make a recommendation to the committee. I don't want to tell you what you should do. Uh, I want you to simply take the information you've received here during the course of these hearings. Stick to the facts. Stick to the witnesses that provided credible facts. I'd be cautious of people who come out and say, spray, don't spray as a recommendation. Thank you very much. Thank you. We, uh, again, we appreciate your presentation here to the committee this morning.